Ah, uh, you remember those days back in elementary school where you bring your Pokemon cards and show them off like they're the hottest currency on the playground and showing off your favorite card and explaining why it's so much better than literally every other card? Well, today we're exploring Isle Swaps, a deck building trading card roguelike that brings you back to those nostalgic vibes, just like when you were back on the playground. So if you've ever wondered what it's like to swap cards while getting the coolest critters around, stick around and we'll see if this game is worth your time. Welcome back to the roguelike spotlight. Today we're diving into Isle of Swap. We'll check out the coolest critters you can collect and I'll break down its components before giving it a rating out of five based on my experiences. Let's break down this critter collector and pray for no lawsuits. But of course, before we all begin, let's explain what Isle Swaps is. What is that? What the f Isle of Swaps is a roguelike deck builder in the style of popular trading cards games, primarily based off of the Pokemon TCG, as it is styled with monster catching and energy systems, though that part is more like mana and other TCGs. You take control of one of four unique characters, each with their own passive abilities to become the best. That being said, you have one more goal to complete, the Master Binder. With each run, you'll master cards which you can put into the binders, thus unlocking them forever, for the Champion Circuit Mode, in which you build a deck and run down three hard fights to get even more cards for your binder. A normal run lets you run through three areas set up by a specific character which is really interesting because most of them are actually ran by another playable character except for wait who are you why are you here anyways i think it's a bit weird that some of the characters aren't playable i think they should be playable just to round it out and i think it would make it more interesting from a story perspective as all these characters are fine to be the best on the playground, I think it makes sense that they all have their own tries at the challenge. But, now that you know what the game is and you're ready to catch them all- FBI, open up! I mean, you're ready to play. Let's talk about gameplay. You will quickly see the game is very simplistic with the ability to play three different critters on the field. And with creature, the larger your deck will need to become. Each critter usually has some form of passive ability that activates given a certain criteria. There are a few that don't have abilities at all, but usually have some form of inflated stats saying screw passives and going straight fisticuffs. That being said, to have your critters do anything, you need to be able to play ability cards and energy cards. You get to play three cards per turn. Energy cards are quite self-explanatory. They give you energy to be able to play some ability cards. Basic energies actually don't cost a card to play, but duo energy cards do cost a card. And all ability cards, of course, use a card. And that being said, they range in a variety of different moves from just attacking, buffing, setting up traps on the field, any combination of that, and many more. Though, talking about energies and ability cards, why on earth would I want to use a dual energy card over a basic gain energy ability? Like, look at these two. One of them gives flat energy and another energy based on the type of a critter, but I could use this ability that gives me two energy and does some kind of effect. Burns them, gives them so, gives me critical. It does so many different things. This is just strictly better and it's a less rarity, so it's more likely I'll find them. I don't see why I would ever use a basic dual energy card over a actual gain energy ability. Maybe if the ability cards were nerfed to only gain one energy, it would be better. But that being said, most cards are balanced except for the whole energy thing. And you can basically get any anything working in this game, which is very fun. Going back to the characters, I will say a few of them are much better than the rest of the cast. <coughs> Dottie. <coughs> yeah, Dottie is more busted than my first mouse that I got a hold of on the family computer. The ability to copy every third ability is absurd. Card one, gain energy. Card two, gain energy or buff. Card three, wipe the board. Rinse or repeat. GG, easy, shake my hand. Yeah, they're utterly broken in comparison to the other characters. I will say the other two that come after Dottie are okay. Their abilities have their place and can be powerful, but Dina, oh Dina, oh our nice little pro tag. Yeah, Dina's ability is not really good except for collecting cards, which makes sense because her backstory is she is the owner of the Master Binder, so her whole thing is to collect cards from battle and swapping. But looking at from the battle perspective, the actual fighting, perspective she is bad but all that being said it is a fun deck builder combining fun tcg elements to a more traditional roguelike deck builder i'll give gameplay a four out of five it was really smooth though some of the characters are less powerful than the others they all have their roles now that we tackled gameplay let's talk about the vision and i'll say from very very first impressions the models might not look the best but hear me out hear me out I said, hear me out. Yeah, that's right. Anyways, though they might not look impressive at the start and honestly, depending on your perspective, might look bad in your eyes. I honestly think it's amazing for this game. What? 
Let's look at it from this perspective. You are a kid who is here to play with these overpriced pieces of cardboard that look pretty. Though the images might not be amazing to you, it looks wonderful. I mean, look back at your favorite childhood game. I'm pretty sure if you compared it to today's standards, it could probably use a few more pixels. Plus, we filled in those gaps with our imaginations, experiencing it in a whole different way. It's a style that really gives me some nostalgia, in all honesty, having to look at this in a more imaginative way. At least that's what it felt for me. When playing at first, I wasn't sold, but as soon as I started to run and saw the first map unfold in front of me, the key items popping out like a storybook, I couldn't help but think from that perspective. I think in general, it might not look the best, but just the overarching world of the game makes it fit perfectly. Though that being said, moving to the carts themselves, they are made by a variety of different artists, each having their own style and wonderful look how they design the cards. Of course, a couple of the cards look a little weird, but if we look back at the inspiration, looking at old Pokemon cards, we can see that there are plenty of cards that have this lower quality look. So I think it makes complete sense. Honestly, the way the visuals are made truly brings me back to those after school days where I would show off my cards and pretend we actually knew how to play the game as we just shouted out moves trying to be as cool as possible. Visuals for me are honestly a five out of five. Given the world and the concepts behind them, they just fit so well in the vibe of this game. I don't care if they aren't impressive by traditional standards. For me, it's all about the storytelling and putting you in this immersive world. And this game does a wonderful job of achieving that. Now that we feast our eyes on the visuals, let's tune our ears back into the audio. And I will say where the visuals have its charm, the audio has some of the charm as well. Listening to the soundtrack, I will say again, it's not the most amazing, and that's more than okay. It still executes itself well enough. Sadly, I don't think it brings as much charm as those visuals to really captivate me. They play well, and going back to the kid's perspective, if we listen to it, I could totally see this being one of those themes that's going on in a kid's head as they imagine all the amazing things their cards are doing, but it sadly doesn't transport me into the world as much as the visuals do. By no means are they bad, and the sound effects are okay as well nothing too crazy. Some tracks do feel like they stand out in a bad way, feeling like they just don't really fit the scenario. I would like to see some of the area themes that are way overhyped be shifted to, into a more calm, progressive build and bring that higher energy music to the actual boss theme, giving each area their own unique boss music. That being said, I would like to give audio a three out of five. It's okay, but it doesn't enchant me like the visuals do. And like I said, it feels like some area themes just are too much at times. I feel like the hype the music gives should be repurposed for more exceptional fights. Now they went into the audio, let's get into our favorite part, the replayability. It's roguelike after all. And for replayability, it's pretty good. There are 70 creatures, four characters, and you get a list of premutations. I'm too lazy to come up with, but hey, it's a lot. So you get a lot of variety. Plus on top of that, why to complete the master binder and you get a good amount. And there are two modes, normal runs and champion runs. Normal runs are three full length areas and champion runs are just three fights, which gives a bit of variety. Also in normal runs, there's a Nuzlocke mode, which is basically the concept of Pokemon Nuzlocke, which is the concept of Pokemon Nuzlocke, where you lose the Pokemon if they reach zero HP and then faint, which is the same here, but you also lose a life. And then there's a randomizer mode where everything is well random so it keeps you trying new things but like all good things we have to find the end and that really comes from filling up the master binder once you unlock everything there pretty much isn't anything to keep you going except for achievements a solid four out of five for replayability you get a good amount of different things to try and there's a good amount of achievements to keep you going that being said replayability can sometimes be affected by difficulty and isle of swaps is a good example of this moving to difficulty the game is so so easy. It's almost sad. I don't know how you can lose. The game gives you two lives and the fights are so easy. Even though the enemies don't need to care about things like energy, they don't have their own unique abilities and you can just plow your way through them if you are even a little decent at deck builders and slash or TCGs. Honestly, it's almost insulting at times. The so-called hard champion mode in theory should be hard, but nope, you get to choose your deck so you can just annihilate everything in your path with one move, especially if you play Dottie, who is not balanced at all, may I reiterate. Opponents or at least bosses really need to have their own abilities or inflated stats or something to give a bit of a challenge you need to add a higher difficulty mode this game is just utterly easy the only saving grace might be the nuzlocke mode but 
even then I had no difficulty with it, but it made me think slightly more. So I'm gonna give difficulty a two out of five. It's easy. It's stupidly easy, but I will give it some benefit of the doubt. Maybe I'm just overly experienced with these types of games, but this game really needs more difficulty. Unlike letting me know your thoughts about this game. If you're enjoying the video, please leave a like and don't forget to share your thoughts on this game in the comments. I'd love to hear what you think. But going back, of course, after six plus hours of trading critters and invalidating the game, I find myself enjoying this game quite a bit. And while it's super easy, the overall presentation and nostalgia I get from it, I will happily give this game a four rainbow energies out of five. A very interesting concept and pretty fun roguelike deck builder. But is it worth your time, money, and threat of developing a crippling trading card addiction? Well, if you like critter collecting trading card games, and slash or have some nostalgia with this genre and would like to have that in your roguelike, I would say yes, I would recommend it. Actually, thinking of another interesting deck building roguelike, you should take a look at this video on Cobalt Core, a very fun space themed deck building roguelike game. Oh, you're, you're still here. You should go click that video. Or actually, I have a crippling addiction to trading card games myself. If you're interested in seeing some of my most prized cards I own, let me know down in the comments. Say trading cards in the comments without any context if you want to see. And I'll make a community post and I'll show you. All right, bye.